worship service. I hope you have a great Sabbath and that your worship together will be something that uplifts us all and lifts us towards God. This afternoon at 5.30, one of our people, Emily Igarashi, will be baptized in the sanctuary at 5.30. Everyone is invited. A reminder, November the 7th, the Soma Community Church will start worshipping with us again. They will be using the facility on a regular basis. And so uh, you can expect to see them around during the week and obviously also on Sunday. Another important event on Sunday is the Fall Festival at Rio Lindo. Uh, that is from 3 to 6 at the Athletic Field on the Rio Lindo Academy campus. Remember, of course, that Pastor Brad and Mary Lou are looking for volunteers for the Redwood booth. So if you can volunteer between 3 and 6, that would be great. Go and see Pastor Brad or Mary Lou. Put your name down on that sheet. And of course, we hope that everyone has a great time socializing together. And of course, that we raise lots of money for Redwood and for youth ministries at Sanford. An important reminder about Vespers next week. Well, uh, we'll have our Friday night Vespers. It will be in the church at 7 p.m. Next weekend will be a very exciting weekend because we have several events going on. Uh, of course, there is the Vespers, but also there will be a planning meeting for the youth ministries. Uh, that will be at 6.30 uh, in the kindergarten room. There will also be a first time children's ministries youth night. That will be at 6 p.m. in the Vine Center. And of course, for the youth ministry planning, uh, if you are a parent or if you are a youth member, please come to that meeting. And of course, all children are invited to the movie night. There will be snacks, I hope. A couple of reminders about events that are starting, of course, perhaps the most important, Cradle Roll uh, is uh, starting, started two weeks ago and continues. If you have a child between the ages of zero and four, then please come to play Cradle Roll. It's at 10 a.m. in the Cradle Roll South School. And of course, uh, for those of you who are in the older age group, uh, the gathering is now meeting at 9.30 in the church sanctuary, followed by our Sabbath school lesson study. Morning, everyone. Hello. I'm hot. Welcome to uh, welcome to to church. Today's um, an awesome day, and um, we're going to start off with a song uh, called "House of the Lord." And just wanted to kind of go over the chorus with you, so that. When the choruses come in, you guys will be familiar with it. You'll be able to come in. Let's all stand and, and, and get into this. This is a really joyous song. Um, so uh, just want to go over the chorus with you real quick. There's joy. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, there's joy in the house of the Lord, our God is surely in this place, and we won't be quiet, we shout out your praise. So that's, that's how that goes. And so that's not it, it's cold in here, so we gotta get moving, right? Get the blood flowing, so I want you guys to start clapping your hands.
All right, everybody. Let's uh, let's do some more praising. We're just one big happy family. That's why I'm here. It's an amazing place. Felt it from the first time I came in here. Definitely. the words to overcome. Um, Thank you. 
you guys keep standing. This is a good song to kick out some energy. Or kick out some energy. My Savior, my God, He's a good God. We don't always understand, and I'm just going to take a minute because if I try too hard, I'm going to make myself crazy trying to figure out who God is and why God does what God does. In our lives, we don't always see the end from the beginning. And in the middle is a hard place to be sometimes. But if we look back, God shows us, hey, I had to take you through that. And it's okay. I'm your Savior, and, and we turn to Jesus as our Savior. He's going to take us through it every time.
Those of you who were in church on Saturday last week heard me talk about intentional giving, and I'm going to say some more about that. But actually, I'm going to start with a little story. Uh, my sister's church is about the size of this church. That is to say, we have they have about 650 members. We have 600 plus, something like that. And a few years ago, they decided that they wanted to have a youth pastor. And in order to get a youth pastor, they needed to produce a certain amount of money for the conference. And then they decided they'd really like a children's ministries pastor. And to do that, they needed to get a certain amount for the conference. And then they decided that they'd need a women's ministry pastor. And to do that, they needed to give a certain amount in offerings. My sister's church, which is the same size as this one, has five associate pastors now. Yes, I'm glad somebody said wow. Do you know how they did it? Simply by deciding each week that everyone, every member would decide to give a certain amount to these things that they wanted to accomplish in the community and in their church. They intentionally decided that they were going to get two. Well, I think they were going for four, but now my sister tells me they're up to five. Okay, now I'm not saying that we should plan for five associate ministers, although I'm looking for Pastor Brad, he's very excited. <laughs> he's like that, he's waving his hands excited. <laughs> but it is a lesson for me, for all of us, right? What we can accomplish if we really want to, 
and what we can accomplish if we deliberately decide to do this. So here's my challenge to you and to myself. What do I want to accomplish for God over the next year? And obviously, I want to do that in my life, but I also want to do it through my giving. Think about what it is that you can do and say to God, you know, that thing that keep, keeps waving at me, I brought a box for this time, just in case. These are the boxes I had in my office that you can fill up. Through my giving each week, I will demonstrate that I can achieve whatever it is that I think I can do for God over the next year. That's my challenge to you. Now children, you're going to come forward now and um, the extra offerings, because of course all the adults are going to get out these envelopes and they're going to put something in there and they're going to write on those envelopes, right? But the extra offering, the, they just feel like giving because, well, that's how God is. Uh, they're going to give to you. So children come forward right now and deacons who I'm not seeing but they're somewhere around, um, please take up the offering from the part that people give deliberately and intentionally. Thank you.
That's what he loves. He loves to get his scriptures. And he is really insistent. If you start giving him any scratches, especially on his belly, but behind his ears, he will grab your arm and drag it right back to him, demanding more scratches. And if you if you sit there long enough, he'll start grunting at you. The Bible tells a story. Uh, Jesus, in fact, tells a story, and it's a parable about a woman who, who needs some justice from a judge, and so she goes again and again and again to the judge, and eventually the judge gives her justice. And Jesus says that that, that judge gives that woman justice not because he is just or because it's the right thing to do, but because she was so persistent. You know, I sometimes don't give my dog scratches because it's the right thing to do or because I am a particularly good and warm owner of pets, but because sometimes they are just so persistent, I have no other choice. But Jesus says that God isn't like that. That if we pray, we, God answers our prayers not only because we are persistent in them, but because he loves us. And just like that pet of mine, Shepherd, was in the video with all his gray hair. If we bring God our concerns, the things that worry us, and especially if we bring them to him every day, God is more than really excited and happy to answer those prayers. Isn't that amazing? Let's thank God for being so good to us. Dear Jesus, we are so grateful to have a God who hears us when we pray, who we don't have to force or badger into listening to us, but you want to. You look forward to those opportunities. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for listening to my story. Yes, and get back to your seats. with us here at the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. It is so good to sing together. Wasn't it a blessed time to sing with uh, our, our worship team and, and really have loved to hear that singing you shared with us today. I want to just point out one uh, announcement from me, which is that the Fall Fest that's happening at Rio Lindo, that's tomorrow. And that starts at 3 o'clock. It goes till 6 whether it is raining or not, if it's raining, it will be inside. If it's not raining, it will be outside or maybe inside if it's like sopping wet everywhere. I don't know, Denise? Yeah, that. Okay, great. So please join us. And I want to share our students at Redwood actually made a promo video for the Fall Fest that we're gonna share with you. <laughs> today at 5.30 right here in this room. We're going to have a potluck afterwards, but wanted to just show you Emily uh, painted or on, on a foam the picture that is on the front of your bulletin. So really wanted to, to share that with me. She shared that with me a couple months ago. I absolutely love it. 
So thank you, Emily. We are so excited about the decision that you are making for the Lord. Well, we have been we have been looking and talking about our identity over the last couple of weeks, specifically through the lens of what we mean and what are we saying about ourselves when we say we are Seventh Day Adventists. And, and Seventh Day Adventists, with, with the conclusion that we've come to over the last two weeks, that being a Seventh Day identifies us as those who keep the Sabbath, identifies us as those who earnestly await the second coming of Jesus. And because we are waiting for Jesus' return, we share the good news of Jesus with the world. That's how we back up our identity as Adventists. Now, I need to tell you something that is seemingly un a big fan of the Golden State Warriors. I know. I've kept it under wraps. And I really appreciate Anna making me masks so that at all times I can sort of uh, keep that secret. Uh, and, but it's important for me, it's important to me that you know that I am not just a regular old fan of the Golden State Warriors. I mean, one of the things that's been a big struggle for me over the years is when I started being a fan, the team was terrible. And so I had a lot of street cred, if you will, if you can imagine that. Which is to say, I was a fan of a team that wasn't good, and there's something morally better about me because of that. <laughs> But then they, go, they now they are this great team, in particular the last five years. They've been excellent, and there are fans all over the place. And I fear that when people see me wear my mask or my shirt or, or talk about it, they think I am sort of this newfangled fan. And so it I occurred to me, how, how can I show that I am... I have that identity of being a fan of the Warriors in a more profound way. So I'm going to tell you a story about when I was in college, which is sort of the, the signal that you should brace yourself for shenanigans. <laughs> so myself and one of my best friends, Blake, we went actually with some people from church, as I recall, to a game. I think it was 2008 against the Celtics. Did anyone else go to this game? We stood and I, I remember we went, went with people from church and from Redwood. We went to the game and before the game, they asked us, do you want to, do you want to stand by the home locker room and high five the team, the home team on the way out or by the away locker room and high five the away team on the way, on the way into the, onto the court. And I'm thinking, well, obviously it's the Warriors, but all three-pointer from Baron Davis. It was unbelievable. The, the, the house came down, like, as we were walking out, wall-to-wall -wall people, people are just chanting, warriors, warriors. It was a wonderful evening. Now, uh, my, my friend Blake and I, and I think two or three other people, we had drove, we drove to the arena from PUC up in Angwin in our little Dodge, my Dodge minivan that my parents let me drive. Green kind of deadly puke colored, really. And by the time we made it back out to the parking lot, it had been a long time, it was a packed house. And when we got to the parking lot, as we were pulling out, we saw coming out of the player's parking lot, Baron Davis driving a convertible. And as one, mind melded, we said, we got to follow it. Which, thinking back, is sort of a terrible idea, like vaguely a crime. But anyway, we said, we gotta follow him. So we, he pulled out right in front of us and we just, we were on his tail. Like he was driving, I think, some kind of like BMW Z series, something or other. And I was driving our like 2003 Dodge Caravan. <laughs> and he pulled onto the freeway and man, I had that thing floored. All the guys in the car, like, ah, there, there. Finally, we, we catch up to him on the freeway, going, I don't know how fast, and we roll down the windows of this, of this Dodge Caravan, and all of us are like hanging out, we're driving 90 miles an hour down the internet. Don't do this, did I preface this already? 
shouting, Baron, Baron, Baron. And he looked at us like you would expect. Like we were crazy people. Because in retrospect, fair, very fair. Here are a bunch of 20-somethings hanging out of a minivan at midnight on 580. Uh, uh, going 90 miles an hour. So he pulled off the freeway, and, but we thought this was the pinnacle. We peaked just now. We had an, a, a real interaction with Baron Davis. So it's important for me that you know that's the sort of Warriors fan that I am. I'm the sort of fan who chases Baron Davis on the interstate in order to scream at him through the window. That's the sort of person I am. <laughs> Identity is of vital importance to us. Is PowerPoint working for us today? Thank you. Identity is of vital importance to us. And so today we're going to go one step beyond asking, what does it mean to be a Seventh-day Adventist? We're going to ask, what does it mean to be part of of the Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist Church. What, what is that next piece? So we've talked about how this identity that ideally about 20 or 25 million people around the globe could share of Seventh-day Adventists. But what, when I say, well, I'm a member of the Santa Rosa Seventh-day, I worship with the Seventh, that's my church family. What are we saying about ourselves? And how do we back that up? That's really the question. So our elder team here at Santa Rosa, we, we invested hours of thought and prayer and conversation into that exact question. And out of that, the Lord really emphasized three areas of focus, which are reflected in three statements of Jesus. And so we're going to go through this and hopefully sort of share, like, this is what we feel like it means to be a Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist. That's what I'm, this is how, what we're saying about ourselves and how we back that up in our lives. Now, before I do that, I'm gonna invite our elder team to stand. So if you are a, an elder, I, I just wanna invite you to stand here. That way, if you don't like what we said, you... <laughs> So here, this is our elder team, or at least those who are among us this morning. And, and this is something we pray through. Thank you guys so much. And I'll, if, you have, if you have a concern, I've got their names, their numbers, and their addresses. <laughs> this is something we really prayerfully consider. And it sort of, in retrospect, these three sort of dimensions of what it means to be a Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist come out of that prayer and conversation. So we're in Matthew chapter 22. Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Jesus is kind of at the tail end of people sort of wrestling with him about who he is. And so he, he drops some deep wisdom on them. Well, the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, which was a whole thing. If you read the Gospels ever... There is sort of a two-party system in Jerusalem. And unlike how well Republicans and Democrats get along, the Sadducees and the Pharisees did not like each other. <laughs> and so they, they, this verse really, we get, we get behind sort of the po politics of the day. Like the Pharisees essentially were extremely uh, conservative. They believed like, the letter of the law is all that matters. The Sadducees were kind of more liberal. They didn't even, they were Sadducee because they didn't even believe in the resurrection. Um, so the Pharisees hear that Jesus had sort of put the Sadducees in their place and they're like, oh, great, he's on our side. So we're going to get him to answer our questions. What's important to us? They gather together and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Now this was the question. If, if you were a Pharisee, and really if you were a Jew, this was all that mattered. Really the, the practice of the day when it came to interacting with God's word was all about ranking. 
You have hundreds of laws that you find in Scripture, and part of the job of the lawyer, the one who's asking the question, is ranking them so that you know which is more important. For example, if it was Sabbath, but you needed to go care for your mother or your father who was on the other end of town, someone needed to know, okay, is it more important for me to keep the Sabbath or to honor my father and mother? And depending on what lawyer of the law you talk to, one might say, the Sabbath is more important so mom and dad, they'll figure it out on their own. Another might say, ah, well, really, God is our father, so you should, you should break the Sabbath and go help them out with whatever they need. And that was the whole discussion. That's what they were all about. So they come to Jesus with that question. They're obsessed with it. Which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus said to them, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is is the great and first commandment. This is where it begins, Jesus says. It is about your connection with God and how you are pouring your life out for Him. So to reflect that in what we believe, we are saying it means to be a Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist. We are saying we, we want to know God intimately. We want to know God intimately. We're going to follow Jesus' great commandment of love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. We're saying know God intimately. Some of you, are, you're maybe sort of catching a glimpse of a banner we have here in church. Know, love, and share. That, that is not an accident. So that's part of our first real point of emphasis. We are people dedicated to knowing our God intimately. Everything we do is focused through that lens. And that intimacy, that is meant to be deep and wide with our hearts, our souls, our minds, our strength. Jesus continues, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. So Jesus is saying, here are the greatest commandments. The first is to, to love God with everything. The second is, is paired with it. They are inextricably linked. And that is to love your neighbor as yourself. So as we think about how are we backing up our identity as Santa Rosa, Seventh-day Adventist, we're saying that we love each other selflessly. Right? Look. Love your neighbor as yourself. That, that is a selfless love we are sharing. So part of the connection that we are experiencing, that we are living, is within our church. That, that when you are hurting, we are hurting with you. When you are rejoicing, we are rejoicing with you. We are becoming one and loving each other selflessly. A little bit later in, in Matthew's Gospel, as Jesus is preparing to leave the earth, he kind of gives his disciples one last word. We, we talked about the, the great commandment. And that this third dimension that we're talking about is from the great commission. Matthew 28, starting in verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus has sort of a great command. Know God. Love the Lord your God. Love your neighbor. And he, he finishes with this great commission. Go to the world, all nations, with this message of a God who loves us. So we're saying, share the good news boldly. And th this is what we 
would say these three dimensions are central to who we are as Santa Rosa Seventh day Adventists. We know God intimately, love each other selflessly, and share the good news boldly. And we're going to be processing these things together as a church family. On Sabbath morning over the next three weeks, we're going to look at each of those three pieces in a very specific way, as well as in a community way. But I want to share with you sort of an encapsulation, I think, where Jesus exemplifies precisely what we're talking about in, in a single passage. Now, I, I tend to organize my sermons like this. I had like the short version where it's like, all right, I can end here. And then I look at the clock on Saturday morning, and I'm like, oh, I think I can sneak in a few more minutes. So I have, I have a bonus material. So we're in bonus material today. This is fun. <laughs> and, and so I want to look at the book of John, chapter 1. So if you've got a Bible, you've got a, you've got a Bible on your phone, find John, chapter 1. So our mission, know God intimately. Love each other selflessly. Share the good news boldly. Know, love, and share. Jesus, one of the first things he does on earth in John's gospel, really beautifully illustrates what this looks like in life. What this looks like in chasing Baron Davis on the 580. The next day again, John, this is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come. And you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John, you shall be called Cephas which means Peter. So I want to look at this passage. Jesus is sort of showing us these three dimensions of, of know, love, and share. So the first thing that happens is John the Baptist points Andrew and John, who wrote this gospel, but leaves himself unnamed because that's his M.O., Points him to points them to Jesus, and they, they follow Jesus. And when they speak to him, Jesus says, "What are you seeking?" And they, they say, "Well, where are you staying?" They, they're almost caught off guard by the question. But Jesus just invites them, "Come, and you will see." It's just this invitation that Jesus offers to Andrew and to John. Hey, get to know who I am. It's, you're, you're welcome to be in relationship with me. It's that first piece of, of connecting with God. So I want you to see, though, the language here, because I think the language speaks volumes to us. The next day, we're going back to the beginning of the passage, John was standing with two of his disciples. So notice how John writes about himself and Andrew. It was two of them, right? They, they are two individuals who are there listening to John the Baptist speak. John the Baptist looks at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. And the two disciples, these two individuals, heard him say this and notice, and who followed Jesus? Not, and the two disciples followed Jesus. And they followed Jesus. There's a really deliberate use of language here, which is to say that, that Jesus, in following Jesus, in getting to know who Jesus is, two individuals became a they. 
They became a community in pursuit of knowing Jesus. And that's the language that is used. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, and they said to him, and, and immediately as they're getting to know Jesus, community has formed. And that's what we're talking about is, is we love each other selflessly. We are drawn together because we are knowing God intimately. And you cannot help but enter into community with one another when we pursue a knowledge of who God is. Amen. Finally, they, they spend a the day with him. And John cannot help it. After spending time with Jesus, or Andrew, excuse me, he first found his brother Simon. So he spends the day with Jesus, and immediately he says to them, dude, you've got to come and meet this guy. You've got to learn who this person is. You've got to become part of our them, our they, our community. That, that sharing of the good news just came innately out of Andrew. And that's what we are, I love this story because it's, it's all here. It, it is, we are Santa Rosa Seventh-day Adventist. We are following the invitation to come to know God intimately. Because we are doing that, we are loving each other selflessly. We are becoming a community. And out of that community, out of that knowledge of God, we cannot help but share with others who it is we are coming to know and what it is we are experiencing together. We're Santa Rosa Adventists. And because we are, we know God intimately, we love each other selflessly, and we share the good news boldly. Let us pray again. Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving us a church. Lord, a church of those who have been here for years, those who have been here for hours, those who have been, those who will be. We are here to know you because of your great love. Let us love one another. Let us share that incredible news and you with this world. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Happy Sabbath, everybody. Thanks for worshiping us.